So how many of you own a piece of garment that is made from yak down? Raise your hands. There's a few. Now, how many of you own a piece of garment that's made from cashmere? A lot more of you. Now, you may not be aware that 80% of the world's yak population is, in fact, in Western China. And that for every five cashmere goats, there is one yak. Now, we all live in Shanghai, which is the fashion capital of China, and it's trying to make that place in the world. So in theory, it should be safe to assume that for every five of you that own a cashmere garment, that one person would own something from yak. And yet it's clear that that's not the case. And the question is why? And the answer is the lack of innovation. That Chinese manufacturers are not known to be the innovative. They think that Western brands and designers want wools and cashmeres. And Western brands and designers don't know about the yak because yak isn't native to where they are from. So they're not asking the Chinese manufacturers of, the, uh, of cashmere and of wool. So therefore, we have 14 million yaks roaming on the Tibetan plateau. Their owners, Tibetan herders, who have very limited cash income. And what could potentially have been a thriving industry today barely exists. Now, when we oftentimes think about innovation, we think about the latest and greatest Apple product these days, or Steve Jobs, or all the consumer electronics and latest mobile technology. But us as a human race, we have been inventing from the very beginning. And when they discovered the artifacts and, uh, from Zhou Kodian of the Peking Man, they realized that over nearly 700,000 years ago that the human race was inventing. And the key about innovation that has lasted the test of time was that they've always innovated with what was right in front of them. That at that point, they had stone, and they made stone tools, and they learned how to make fire. And it was in these very simple innovations that the, it was the beginnings of our human civilization. But oftentimes, what is right in front of us could be what is the most overlooked. And so that is the idea that I want to share with you today. And specifically, look into three areas. Waste, raw materials, unconventional raw materials, in fact, and also in cultural heritage. That if we think about innovations in these three areas, and these areas that we oftentimes overlook, it could potentially have the most innovative, sustainable, native, and powerful impact. Now, when we think about waste, environmental pressures and climate change and sustainability, all this especially is in the forefront of our minds or in our eyes or in our lungs these days. And yet, when we think about environmental sustainability or waste management, we think about it in terms of a cost, that it's going to be extremely expensive to be environmental. Well, Zhang Ying, she did not think so. She's a Chinese entrepreneur from Heilongjiang. And in the 1990s, she started importing waste from American landfills into China. She thought that there was an opportunity because China as a country was growing so rapidly that there would be a need for paper products, cardboard boxes, and that China did not have enough pulp to support that. So by importing the waste from the United States, buying it very cheaply, by 2010, she was named as one of the world's wealthiest self-made women with a fortune of $4.6 billion. And that is above Oprah. <laughs> and that's innovation, and innovation around waste, and that's an incredible story. That if environmental challenges could be think about as a top line, then maybe the air wouldn't be so bad today. The second area is raw materials. And you may not know that every year, the food industry, we throw away 500,000 tons of crab shells. And Yi Cui, a Chinese professor at Stanford University studying material sciences, is leading a team to look at the crab shell because he believes that in the crab shell, the structure of it can actually be a template for to making lithium ion batteries uh, using renewable resources, but even better, longer lasting. And that's an incredible innovation as well, that this is an unconventional raw material. We often throw it away. We think about it as waste. And yet again, there is opportunity, and these opportunities are not found. 
When I came to China, I wasn't thinking about crab shells or waste. I was thinking about what were the possibilities to start a business in China that could have social impact. And in school, we, you know, and we, we think about it as social entrepreneurship. But most basically, how do you have impact through a business model? And I started with Western China because I believe that in Western China, there are abundant resources. And yet it was underutilized. And there are opportunities, although there is a tremendous income inequality. And that if I could somehow put these pieces together, then there would be a business model. And so I visited nonprofit organizations, and I visited even government bureaus, seeking for ideas, opportunities, and inspiration. And what I came across was yaks, and a lot of them. And in that process, soon realized that yak fiber is, in fact, very comparable to Kashmir, that even in its molecular structure, that it's very similar. And so there was the opportunity, and it was in that opportunity I found in my company, Shoke which means yak down in Tibetan. So I took that very literally. But when we look at yak fiber, and it's dark, it's dirty, and we think, how do we make that into a beautiful product like Kashmir? So we started exploring the possibilities. And through the business model, we start sourcing directly from the Tibetan herders, because that can give them a 10 to 30% increase in their income. And then while we are sourcing from the herders, because we are at the source, we can segment it based on quality. And that's not rocket science, that at its source, if you source it at, at its quality, that different quality of yak fiber can be made into different types of products. And again, because this Im industry is so immature, all of this did not exist. And so we challenged that, we pushed that, we asked manufacturers to explore the different kinds of color ranges, and even color was innovative for yak fiber, because the core of yak fiber is in fact a dark brown. And so we continued to push the boundaries of what can be made with yak fiber. And we started looking at different patterns and blends. We started seeing if yak fiber could be blended with uh, cotton and wool and bamboo and, um, and mixed in different ways. Could it be hand knit? Could it be machine knit? And what are those possibilities from a textile standpoint? And from that point, what are the beautiful products that we can create? and how we can work with different designers for them to use our fabrics and that they can design with our fabrics or we can share our collections to the retail customers ourselves. And we've been in business for seven years, continuously pushing the boundaries of what one can do with this fabric. And it is both challenging and rewarding. And when you now look at yak fiber, it's still um, a very niche fiber, but yet more and more designers and brands are starting to look into the fiber. That means the pie is getting bigger, but that also means that our first mover advantage will, will soon vanish very quickly. And that for us to stay competitive as a company, we can't just focus on the yak fiber itself, but we have to focus on what does it mean to build a brand. Now, I don't come from a fashion or textiles design, marketing, or branding background. Remember, I was simply looking at this business model and saying, how can you create social impact? And so as I was looking for inspiration, and China is a place full of culture heritage, I started to realize that there is another piece of the story that we could tell, and that is innovation around cultural heritage. And that cultural heritage in a place like China, with the pressures of modernization, of looking forward and uh, being similar to the West, that what is of the past is oftentimes forgotten, thought of as less important, or put into a museum, and the money you make is from the ticket sales. But when you consider China, and specifically since we live in Shanghai, that in the past, over 60% of Shanghai was in Shukuman houses. But with the pressures of modernization, many of these older houses had to be torn down, and it is the high-rises that we now see today. Now, when Shuiyang Group had the opportunity to look at what is now Xintiandi, they were hoping to do something very different. So in the late 1990s, early 2000s, they took this place and said, how can we connect this piece of land? Let's not build yet another high rise, but can we connect to the culture heritage, something of the past, connect it that to the present, and also connect that to the future of the city. That the city of Shanghai is changing, and the needs of its citizens are changing. And that people need public places, they need coffee shops, they need bars, places to dine, 
and meet friends and relax and take friends too. And where is that all going to happen if all you have left is skyscrapers? So this mixed use space of what we now know as Xintiandi now seems common sense. But at that point, it was a huge feat to keep this place and make it into connect that culture heritage and connect that to the future. And that became an inspiration for us. That in the areas of culture heritage, that we too have a place to play. That in our supply chain, because we source directly from the herders, and that oftentimes the people who are sourcing and combing the fibers off the yaks are women, that through the supply chain, we are actually connecting women from different social economic backgrounds, cultures, and places. And that even in the supply chain, where we can, we try to employ women to be our hand spinners and women to be our hand knitters. And from these different groups of women from the different geographic places of China, that ultimately the garment is in the hands of a woman as an item that she wears day in and day out. And it's through the supply chain that we connect them into this place of equality. And how do we tell that story in a way that brings out the true heritage of each of those women. And so this year, we led a group of 20 people. They span from business executives to students and even a journalistic photographer who took the, the, the following pictures that I'm, that I'm about to share. And that we, we took them along and retraced the supply chain, educating them about Tibetan culture, Tibetan medicine, and the lives of the local women. And what we found was that our Tibetan community was sharing their story with a sense of pride and a sense of dignity. And that they wanted the, their foreign guests to understand where they are from. And I think that's very unique and special. Because as Tibetans, they too have to cope with the changes of the pressures of modernization. And that while they want to preserve their culture and their lifestyle, how do they deal with the world that is changing? Because many Tibetans have low levels of education, that should they go into the city and should they modernize, that they may only be migrant laborers and be lower rungs in that society. And the truth is they're not even used to city life because all of their lives they've been nomadic. And being in nature is what they enjoy. However, with no economic opportunity and with very limited cash income, it's very difficult for them to survive with the way that the modern economy is structured. And so with Shoke and what we do is that we provide them with this opportunity to be part of our supply chain so that in this transaction there is dignity, that it's of equal footing where they have something to offer and we have something to offer. And it's an exchange and it's equal and there's respect versus the traditional handout where is you have something I need, I'm going to give that to you, and you should be appreciative of what I am giving to you. And so as we start to delve deeper in the meanings behind what we do and understand that there is a sense of beauty and dignity, we realize that, yes, we want to raise awareness about, and continue to do R&D about the functional properties of the yak fiber. But it's also about this Tibetan story and heritage that we want to tell in a very artistic way. And through working with this photographer, we now have a program of an artist in residence where every year we will be inviting different artists to join us on this trip, retracing the supply chain. Because with their different artistic talents and perspectives, they can continue to tell these inspiring stories in different ways that is beautiful, that is dignified, and that really is authentic. And authentic to their culture and authentic to the consumers because they feel like they can connect and everyone is part of that supply chain. So when we think about innovation in China, and as you've heard all of the amazing speakers share about their stories today, I urge you that when you go home, you think about what is right in front of you. Think about what are you overlooking, whether it's the areas of waste, of unconventional raw materials, of cultural heritage, or of something else. But think creatively and innovatively at what is right in front of you, and don't miss that. Because remember, that's where innovation is the most native, it can be the most powerful, it's the most timeless, and that any impact you make in innovation in China, it can affect 20% of the world's population. Thank you. <laughs>